Hello everybody, welcome back to Red Tool House. We are actually not at Red Tool House. We are very, very far from Red Tool House. We are in Vermont. What town are we in? We are in Peachum, Vermont. Peachum, Vermont, and this is my new friend, Morgan Gold. Now, some of you guys may recognize Morgan. Morgan has his own YouTube channel called The Goldshaw Farm, and we are on The Goldshaw Farm. Correct. Welcome. Yes. Glad you could make it, Troy. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate you letting us come up and take a tour and shoot, and but just give us a 40,000 foot elevation of, of your farm set up here. Sure, so I'm a guy who's got no business trying to start a farm, but <laughs> for the last couple of years, we've been trying to start a farm here in Northern Vermont. Um, Right now we do a mix of trees, uh, waterfowl, and uh, we're trying to experiment with a few other things with chickens. But uh, uh, mostly we're known for our ducks, the quacking. You guys might be familiar with them. Yeah. Or release our the geese. Quacking. Yes, release the quacking <laughs> every morning. That's what we do. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. All right. So let's, uh, well, if you don't mind, let's walk around and look at some things there. Let's do it. All right, so Morgan was talking about uh, waterfowl, and so you're doing geese on pasture, correct? Yeah, so this year has been an experiment for us where we're doing uh, rotationally grazed geese. So we have uh, 31 geese, a mixture of Emden and Pilgrim, hmm. and uh, what we're doing is keeping them in a paddock that you see like this for about a week at a time, and then we move it to fresh pasture. It's one of those concepts that people do a lot with cattle, and they do a lot with sheep. But you don't see people do it with geese, and, and geese, though, are grazers, much like cattle and sheep. And so this is an experiment I'm, at, I'm doing right now to try to do a little bit more of a sustainable form of poultry yeah. versus chicken or ducks where you have to truck in the grain and you have a lot of off-farm inputs. Here, because we have so much grass, I think there's an opportunity to try to do this with, with rotationally grazing the geese so far. And so far, it's been working this year. Yeah, and you had mentioned that even looking at kind of the supply of demand around here that... Uh, there's there's a lot of poultry going on, but not too much geese. So kind of filling a filling a void there. It, it's it's going to be the opportunity. I think uh, you know everybody historically thinks of like the Christmas goose, mm -hmm, and yeah. so that's the marketing angle we're going to try to do with it this year. The the biggest hurdle has been actually finding somebody to process them though. Yeah. Uh, waterfowl are much harder to pluck and get a clean carcass sure. compared to chickens or turkeys. And, and so it's been hard to find like a USDA processor, so we're having to process them here on farm, which okay. is fine because it keeps it relatively cheap, but is the downside is I can't sell it anywhere other than farmer's markets or here on the farm. Yeah. yeah. Now in that situation, so if you process here, Will you have all of these sold at processing, or do you have the ability to store in a freezer? What, how are you going to handle yeah, that? So right now we have about half of these guys sold. Oh, cool. Uh, okay. We're still taking reservations, though. So if you guys are interested, <laughs> <laughs> you would like a goose. Um, but so, so, but yeah, my hope is to try to pre-sell them all, so I don't have to hang on to too many of them because they, you know, they leave a pretty big bird and take a healthy amount of freezer space. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt that would. Oh, excellent. Okay. So uh, obviously using uh, Suscovich style chicken tractors, it looks like, but yep. for geese. Um, they don't roost, right? So you don't have to worry about roost bars or anything like that. No. So, so the way this works is, um, you know, keep them about 10 a piece in each house mm -hmm. and I will move the house each day. In order to get them in, it's the only time of day that I actually give them any grain. And so I'll give them like a little bit of a scoop of grain to get everybody in. And it's, it's amazing. They'll all come flock to me to get in there. And I just count them off 10 per and then lock them up for the night. So they're protected from coyotes and bobcats and foxes and uh, out in the morning and they spend their whole day grazing. But yeah, no roost needed. They just sleep right on the ground. Yeah. Um, it's a pretty simple system. Very good. <laughs> So Morgan, how close are these to being ready to go to processing? Uh, they're about uh, three or four weeks away. Okay. Um, so, so they're pretty close to full size. Um, and you know, it's funny, one of the things that people often have as a misconception with geese is that they are, um, you know, really violent and aggressive. But as you guys can kind of see, I mean, they're pretty friendly. They make a little bit of noise, but other than that, they're, uh, you know, pretty relaxed birds. Oh yeah, yeah, they look pretty chill, <laughs> actually. Excellent. Yeah. So what is the so what's the full life cycle range for a goose? So you buy these from a hatchery at I guess just recently hatched, I assume. Yeah. So so just it's just like you do with ducks or chickens or turkeys, where we have um, you know day old goslings or two day old goslings show up in the mail uh, right right at our local post office. Mm -hmm. um, they are you know brooded for I kept them in the brooder for about three weeks, um, and that was back in uh, the end of May. 
Uh, once it got to be June, I actually kept them outside, gave them a heat lamp for about another week and a half or so. And then by the time they fully feather out, they're out here. And it's been, uh, gosh, so June, July, it's almost uh, 16 weeks or so. Yeah. yeah. And then well, I'm trying to go to 20. 20 and, weeks. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's not bad. You know, obviously a little longer for broilers, but my goodness, the, the weight ratio, I'm sure, is, is much... What does a Finnish goose usually weigh out at? Uh, so the the Emdins, which are the larger breed, I think I think they have like a final processed weight of about 12 to 14 pounds. Oh, so, okay. You know, good size, almost that's like a turkey, yeah. more like a turkey equivalent than chicken yeah. equivalent. Yeah, that's a good sized bird. And they're not, uh, even though they have uh, got some pretty good toenails there, they're not hard on the pasture at all. I mean, no, oh, no, I mean, they trample is like the biggest thing. And so like, we could actually walk back there and you'll see the quality of the grass is improving with the rotational grazing then much like you'd see with like sheep or cattle. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So you have the geese, but you also have some duck action going on here, right? Yeah, so, so we have what we call the quacking affectionately here, which is our <laughs> flock of uh, ducks. We do them mostly for eggs, but we also do meat. Um, with ducks, it's really important that you have the right ratio between males and females. Yeah. The duck mating process can be a little aggressive. And okay. so you usually want to have like at least four or five uh, ducks or females for every drake. Um, and so what we do is as we raise them, we'll cull the males and those will go into the freezer, mm -hmm. but then we keep the females on for laying or for hatching purposes. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. good. Good system. Though. So you have uh, Kathy Campbell's, Kathy. <laughs> Khaki. <laughs> that's, who we, that's who we went to high school with, Kathy Campbell. <laughs> Khaki Campbell. And then you have the, uh, you said peaking? Yeah. So, so the Khaki Campbell's are the brown ducks and they're very prolific egg layers. Uh, supposedly they lay about 300 eggs per year. Yeah. Um, and then the white ducks are the Pekin. They're more known for meat. Um, we actually inherited those. Those were given to us by a friend and we've kind of adopted them on just because yeah. of the comic relief that they provide. But uh, yeah, the, those are the two breeds that we've been keeping here so yeah. far. So notice you have three uh, ducklings, or yeah, ducklings there. Yeah. So are you uh, hatching those out yourself? Or are you letting nature take its course? Yeah, so we have some that we, we've hatched through incubators, mm -hmm. but those three right there, we actually tried to, for the first time ever, hatch them naturally. Um, Khaki Campbells, although they're known as great egg layers, they're not great um, mothers. Okay. And so they don't sit on eggs all that well, but I tried an experiment over the last month to try to get them to hatch out and it worked. I had a lot more eggs underneath them and only those three hatched, so maybe it only kind of worked, but yeah. uh, it's been cool to have little babies hatch naturally here on the farm and see how different they seem to be versus the brooder ducklings, which yeah. is just a whole different environment for raising a duck. Yeah, I would think um, I would think naturally raised, they'd be a little more street smart starting out than, uh, I don't know if that's really the proper term. <laughs> yeah, well, street no, I mean, but it's true because I mean, I would never have you know, these guys are about a week old, and I would never have week old ducklings just out loose on the pasture, but sure. because they've got the mom protection, I'm feeling a little bit better. Yeah. A little nervous with the barn cats, but yeah, still yeah, feeling a little sure. bit better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah so uh, about a month ago, we dug this pond. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, so, so we've owned the property for a little over three years, mm -hmm. and every spring, this area right here would always fill up with water for about three to four weeks. And since we have the waterfowl and we have a good use for a pond, what I wanted to try to do is figure out a way to capture more of the water that we have, um, both coming from this side as well as from this side. Yeah. And so got a buddy with an excavator and, and you know, we came in and just dug it up. Um, you'll even notice we kind of cut a, a swale here Yeah. in the name of trying to find the lowest points within the pasture okay. and drawing the water down and into here, um, just as a way to use the earth. We got kind of lucky where most of this is pretty heavy clay, even though most oh, of our right. soil is, is a lot loamier, yeah. especially out back there. Yeah. I've and so that. it's been retaining water much more than I thought. The plan though is when we have our big snow melt, you know, we have about four feet of snow out on this pasture for <laughs> about six months. But once we have that melt, that this will all fill up and we'll have a, a year round pond. So oh, we'll, we'll see how this goes. It's still very much a work in progress. And so, um, Back here, this, these aren't skinny tombstones, right? <laughs> what do we got going on the hillside here? Yeah, so, so this is uh, what I like to call the permaculture orchard. It is an integrated orchard. It consists of about 600 trees and shrubs over about a six and a half acre area. Um, the trees are interplanted, so it's a mix of chestnuts, apple, elderberry, elderberry mulberry, black locust, butternut, and no single tree is planted next to the same tree. Okay. Um, that's done in a way to try to ward off pests and diseases a little bit and just create more diversity. 
There's also the advantage of having nitrogen fixers like a Siberian pea shrub and black locust interplanted with things like chestnut. Right. So it makes the soil a little bit better around it as well and help the growth of the other trees. We planted it about two years ago and uh, now we're getting some of the trees that actually start to pop up over the tree tubes. Mm -hmm. um, we've got you know some black locusts that are up over 10 feet and it's starting to come together. Uh, it's been one of those things that it was the first project I took on with the farm yeah. because I knew it was going to need the most time. But I think long term, it's going to offer maybe some of the greatest dividends, um, even though right now it's just a matter of, you know, trying to mulch it every uh, twice, twice a year. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about. You, you're using the stun method <laughs> on this. So if you don't mind, explain the stun method. Yeah, sure. So. Uh, there's a guy out in Wisconsin by the name of Mark Shepard who I think pioneered this, and it's it's uh, sheer total utter neglect, right. or sometimes people say strategic uh, total utter <laughs> neglect. Yeah, right. But but the intention is this: uh, rather than really babying your trees and treating them like the perfect orchardist, what you do is you just let them grow kind of naturally. So you'll notice the grasses are all tall around here. Mm -hmm. Um, they're sort of, I just let it go. I don't spend a ton of time uh, pruning at this point. I just try to get as much tree growth naturally as I can and see what happens. The trees that survive, great. They keep growing, they keep thriving. The trees that don't, fine. I just replace them with other trees because you know there's no room for babies out here. <laughs> it's right, it's yeah. like toughen yeah. up or, or exactly. die. And, and so that's, that's the method that you have. And it's just a matter of over planting. Like I have trees planted every 10 feet back here. Uh, which is much denser than I need, but mm -hmm. I also know that a chunk of them, like I've had about probably about 20% fail at this point, but that's okay. It's all part of the strategy and trying to get good yeah. natural tree growth. All right, so this is what you're talking about with your swales to, to capture the water coming off the hillside here. Yeah, so we have uh, about 6,000 feet of swale and berm here at the farm. We dug them for the trees, uh, water capture. We have a lot of water that comes down this hill every year, especially with the snow melt. And so the swale is the ditch that you see me standing in here now. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm even shorter than I usually am. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's this trench right here. Yeah. And, and then I'm the berm is this hump Ooh, yeah. that you can see that, yep, Troy's yeah, standing so on there, yeah. So there's the difference. It's yeah. about a foot and a half or so. Excellent. And um, that's, that's where it sort of captures the water. Um, you know, sort of we did this on contour which means we took a look at the lowest points and level points of the land. And I came out here with a laser level and marked each point. And if you looked at an aerial shot of this, you could see the curves of it. Okay. Um, all that's just so that it's level within the swale itself. So the spot that I'm standing in yeah. is more or less level. So it captures the water evenly. Keeps it from just draining to one end and just running out and just becoming a ditch and just exactly. dumping somewhere else. You, you, the whole point of a swale is to retain the water, hold it so it soaks in. And of course the berm being your overburden then soaks that up you got a you got a nice uh, a water soak for for your trees you don't have to irrigate and you're holding water you yeah. got it awesome. um i will say though this is probably one of the biggest mistakes i made with our homestead and farm um it's really hard to mow around here yeah and so part of my adoption of the stun methodology was based on the fact that trying to mow around this berm right here is is darn near impossible and and so <laughs> If, you know, if I had to do it over again, I'm not sure if I would have dug the swales and berms, gotcha. but it's kind of a cool feature and I'm kind of curious to see where this goes. I'm planning on planting more trees up top mm -hmm. and I probably won't do this so that I have some sort of basis of comparison. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be a good my test there. So this beautiful monstrosity, what, what's going on here, Morgan? This thing's <laughs> awesome. So this is probably the coolest feature of the farm as well as the scariest. Yeah. Uh, this is our barn. Um, it's right three stories high. It's over 12,000 feet of square, uh, square footage of um, floor space. Yeah. It was built somewhere around 1890 or so. It was used as a dairy barn and it's a traditional New England dairy barn where you have hay storage up on the third floor. You have a milking parlor and you can actually even see some of the stanchions yeah. right in through there I see them, yeah. on the second floor. And uh, they, they would have the cows walk right up a ramp to go in here every day to be milked. And then on the third floor, it was uh, for horses, pigs, and manure. And um, it, it's, it's been awesome trying to revive it and preserve it, but it's also a challenge. Um, there's parts that are collapsing. There's some work that I need to do and invest some money in repairing like the roof. Yeah. But at the same time, it's just such a cool connection to the history of this farm and the heritage of the farm oh, that I feel it. like it's worth the effort. Right now, we're in the middle of patching up holes like you see here. Yeah. There was actually a portion that was collapsed that we actually stacked up on the other side and uh, 
We'll have one heck of a bonfire this fall. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just trying to do the little repairs. I, I've given up on any ideas of trying to modernize it or change it from what it is. And I'm just trying to preserve it and keep it what it was. Yeah, the, uh, walking through it with you, the beautiful timbers. You can see, like you had mentioned, the some are hand hewn on the older portion of the barn, some of the milled wood, but just beautiful. It looks like American chestnut and some other great species of tree. Just, just a gorgeous barn. Love it. Well, Morgan, again, man, I appreciate you taking the time to let us come uh, snoop around your place. And it's, it's neat. You see something on YouTube, uh, you can't, really can't appreciate it as much until you come to see it. So I appreciate you opening up your house and, and tell Allison thanks, you, thanks for the, the great refreshments and just, just allow us to hang out today. Anytime, man. It's, it's awesome to have you stop by. I mean, it's so good. You know, you, you spend so much time living in kind of a remote place without seeing people on a regular basis or people who might have similar interests in you. Yeah. So for you guys to stop by like this, this is awesome. So, well, so thanks cool. for coming. Yeah, yeah it's, absolutely. It's just a short drive. What is it, about 13 and a half hours? So yeah, <laughs> we'll come up uh, you know, whenever. <laughs> we stop for gas once, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, once or twice. I think I've had to stop. Yeah. But no, again, I appreciate it. Well, everybody, be sure to check out Goldshaw Farms' uh, uh, YouTube channel below and also a podcast. He has a podcast, which is really cool. He, he, Majority of the podcast talks about other farms. He talks to other homesteads and other farms, but he also uh, gives a little peek inside what he's got going on here. So I'll put links below. You guys can check all that out. Well, appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot, man. Take care, everybody. See you guys.